Okay, Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. And uh, we're at the point in Jacob's life where he's heading back home after being away, and he is going to meet his brother for the first time in years. It says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and the man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that the hip was wrenched, and as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. This passage speaks of a time that Jacob, at a pivotal moment in his life, had an encounter with God that changed everything for him. And it's a really strange encounter. Jacob, right through the night, wrestles with a man who he later realizes is God. He asks for a blessing. He says, I won't let go until I'm blessed. And even though at this point, this man puts Jacob's hip right out of joint, right out the socket, an injury that he would carry for the rest of his life, Jacob did not let go. He walks away from this encounter limping, but he walks away from this encounter with a new name, a new blessing, and a new purpose in his life. Now it appears that when we're talking about this wrestling match, we're not just talking about a vision of God here. We're talking about a real, physical person. This isn't a dream like when he saw the, the stairs coming down from heaven. This is a real, physical fight that left him physically hurt. He's referred to as a man in the scripture, but Jacob at the end, he says, I have seen God face to face. And I have survived. God as a man. Now it seems sure to me that when we talk about God as a man, that the person Jacob wrestled with here is Jesus Christ. Jesus before he was ever incarnate. You know, and there's loads of times in the Old Testament where we see this, where Jesus is described before he was known as Jesus. Jesus before he came to earth as a baby. Jesus before people knew who Jesus was. So he's described as God, as a man. He's sometimes referred to as not an angel, but the angel of the Lord. It's God in the form of a man who wrestles with Jacob this night. And I believe he wrestled with Jesus. And I can't think of another encounter in the entire Bible that is quite like this one. Although it was a real physical struggle, the essence of what happened that night is spiritual. Jacob was struggling with God for a blessing. And I'm sure we can all relate to that feeling. And Jacob got it. Because this is more than just a physical struggle, there's things we can learn from this time that Jacob wrestled with God that we can apply to our prayer lives, that we can apply to the way we relate to God, and to the way sometimes we actually struggle with God. 
So how did Jacob end up in this position where he's wrestling next to this river? Well, Jacob at this point has had quite a life. And Steve talked a little bit about Jacob's life a few weeks ago. At this stage, Jacob is returning home after a long time away. 20 years he's been away from home. Two wives later. 11 sons later. And a lot of servants. And Jacob had good reason to be nervous as he stood by this river. You know, Jacob's name, it means, the actual name in Hebrew means, he grasps the heel. And it was a Hebrew way of saying someone who takes advantage, someone who deceives. So just think about that. Uh, next time you're thinking about baby names, Jacob, deceiver. <laughs> Is anyone here called Jacob? Okay, good. Right. <laughs> And boy, did Jacob live up to his name. He was a deceiver and a heel grabber. If you were to ask Jacob's family where he'd been for the past 20 years, actually what they would have told you is that he'd left to find a wife. That's where he'd been for 20 years. Because his mum did not want Jacob marrying a Canaanite woman. Which, considering Jacob came back with two wives, you could say, mission accomplished. He did well. But as far as his brother and as far as his father were aware, this was the reason Jacob left. But his mother knew that wasn't the real reason. You see, Jacob's big brother, and I say big brother in that they were twins, but he was born a little bit earlier and was definitely bigger, Esau had married some local girls. He'd married two women who were Hittites. It says in Genesis 26, 35, these Hittite wives of his were a massive source of grief for his family, especially for his mum. In fact, in Genesis 27, his mum, say, she says to Isaac, she loathes her life because of these women. Now, I'm sure we've all experienced in the past tension with in-laws. But I don't know many people who say they loathe their life because of them. It's not a happy family situation here. So this story that Jacob had left to go and get a wife that his mum approved of, it was a credible story. It was a believable story. In fact, Esau's first response when he hears about Jacob leaving to go and find a wife his mum approves of is that he marries somebody else who's a little bit more in family, someone a little bit closer to home. In fact, who he marries is a daughter of Ishmael, who was his granddad's illegitimate son. So he's, he's, he's keeping it in the family there to try and keep his mum that little bit happier. So he marries a daughter of Ishmael. He marries, I guess it's a second, second cousin or something like that. So Esau must have believed that the reason Jacob left was to find a wife his mum approved of. Oh, but this wasn't the case. That was just a ruse. It was a lie. It was a cover story. Jacob was really fleeing for his life because Esau wanted to kill him. In fact, the only reason Esau had, already, had not already killed Jacob was because of their father. Esau actually once said, once our father's dead, I'm going to kill him. So this old blind man of their father, at least 80 at this point, probably a bit older, probably around about 100 at this point, pretty much on his last legs, was the only thing keeping Jacob alive. So you can understand why Jacob would be a little bit nervous and probably want to get out of there. Why is it that his brother wanted to kill him? Well, Jacob, the deceiver, had stolen something from his brother. He'd stolen something important. And it wasn't his birthright. 
See, that's a misunderstanding of what the situation was between them. The birthright, which is the right to have all of this, the stuff when their dad moves up, passes away, was actually stupidly given away by Esau years ago. That was given away by Esau for a pot of stew. Ridiculous bargain. Now, I'm sure that would have been the source of a little bit of tension between them. I'm sure. The birthright, however, now belonged to Jacob. It was his. It was bought and sold. It was paid for. It may have been an underhand and deceptive way of doing it, but the two of them had managed to live together in relative harmony since that day. No, it wasn't the birthright that Esau was so annoyed about. What Jacob stole was more important than that. It was the blessing. He disguised himself and made himself appear hairy so that their blind father would bless the wrong son. And he steals the blessing that belongs to his brother. And we know that the blessing and the birthright are not the same thing because when Esau hears about it, this is how Esau reacts in Genesis 27, 36. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob, deceiver? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. And then he asks his father, haven't you got a blessing for me? First, he took my birthright. That was bad enough, but now he's took my blessing. That's it. Line crossed. We're done. Esau is furious with Jacob because Esau and Jacob realize the importance and the value of a blessing. Even Jacob knows how serious an issue this is before he does it. He tells his mum when she suggests this action. He says, I'm not going to be blessed. I'm going to be cursed when I do this. And his mum, his mum knows this too because she says, she doesn't deny it. She says, no, no, let that curse be on me instead. They know what they're doing is way over the line. Let me tell you, a blessing is worth more than any birthright. It's worth more than any possessions. A blessing from God is something that truly shapes your life and defines who you are. It's worth more than anything you can earn. It's worth more than anything you can own. A blessing from God is more valuable than any silver or any gold. So what was it that Jacob stole? Well, here's the blessing. Genesis 27, starting in verse 28. It says, May God give you heaven's dew and earth's riches and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. That is what Jacob steals. A prophetic promise over his life and over his legacy. It is a blessing that sets the course for a nation that would come from Jacob. We're not talking about him stealing a couple of tents and some servants here. It's a nation. It's a destiny. Understand, when we talk about Jacob wrestling with God for a blessing, it's not a blessing in the way we so often use that word, blessing. We're not talking about wrestling with God for a new car or a new job or a healing, or, or a car parking space. It's wrestling with God over your divine purpose, over your journey with God, over what God calls you to be and do. You see, we've reduced the idea of what it means to be blessed by God so small. We've sold a blessing of God so short. What Jacob stole was huge. And what Jacob stole cost him hugely. His brother wanted to kill him. His family was ripped apart. 
He lived as an exile for 20 years. And the thing is, he got to see his father again one day, but he never saw his mother again. Gone. You know, Isaac actually died around about the age of 180. It's old. Long after Jacob had returned. When Jacob came back, his father was still alive and was still alive for a good long while. In fact, Isaac was probably still alive years later when Joseph, his grandson, was sold into slavery in Egypt. He was probably still alive for that. You know, it's funny, we always picture this story of, of Jacob and Esau going through this where he stole the blessing as young men, don't we? We always see them as teenagers when this happened. But you're probably talking at least 40 when he stole the blessing. He may even well have been as old as 70 when he stole the blessing. We're not talking about little kids. We're talking about fully grown men. You know what this means? His brother, actually, if he hadn't have left, never would have killed him. Because his dad was still alive when he came back. He actually didn't need to leave. He thought he needed to leave, but he didn't need to leave. He lost 20 years of his life with his family because he stole something and was scared. 20 years of his life gone because of fear. So just imagine, here he is. 20 years have passed. He stood by that river and he has no idea what to expect. Imagine the fear. He's about to meet the man that 20 years ago he ripped off. And he doesn't know what to expect. Can you imagine how he felt as he stood by that river? How big a deal this was for him? Let me tell you. If you are not overwhelmed by the call God has given you, you have not understood it. If you don't feel dwarfed by the scale of your commission, you've missed it. You've not fully got it. Because let me tell you, what God calls us to do is scary. Every time I think about what I know God has called me to do, let me tell you, it's scary. It feels huge. And that's a good thing. Because it's important. In this time of great fear, God meets Jacob. Know this, in those times in your life where you feel like it can't get any worse, that fear is gripping you, where you feel like everything has been stripped from you, in those times of fear and desperation where you feel dwarfed by what's coming, God meets you. God meets you there. And when God meets us, that is when we find out who we really are. You know, Jacob did not call this meeting with God. Jacob did not say, God, I need to speak to you because this is scary. This meeting did not happen on Jacob's schedule. He did not know that morning or that night that he was going to have a life-changing encounter with God on this day. He didn't know that. Jacob did not choose this moment. God chose this moment. And we've got to realize God is not going to work on our schedule. God does not fit into our appointment books or our calendars. But when we reach those moments in the valley... When we reach those moments where it's go forward or run away, and those decisive moments in our life, when we step out, even in great fear, God meets us. God does not let us down. God is there in those times that we need him. 
We don't decide when we encounter God. But what God does is he puts an opportunity before you. He puts a chance for you to encounter him there. And it's up to you to respond to it. Jacob didn't choose that moment, but he could have chosen not to wrestle. He could have chosen not to meet with God. And there's many of us, we get these opportunities and we don't take them. We don't run with it. And Jacob, in this moment, starts to wrestle. He starts to wrestle for a blessing. He was wrestling for a blessing that belonged to him. For God to give him something that wasn't stolen like it was before. Because the blessing he had, Jacob knew it didn't belong to him. And Jacob spent this time wrestling with God for something that did belong to him. You know, we've all wrestled with God at some time in our life. Sometimes we've wrestled with God as we've struggled and tried to do things our way instead of his way. Maybe we've wrestled with God's call in our life. Maybe we've wrestled with God over the things that he's asked us to give up that we don't want to give up. We wrestle over things that are important to us. We fight for them. We wrestle over the things that matter. You know, whenever we wrestle with God, it's for high stakes. Just like it was for Jacob. We wrestle with God over the things that are important to us. Over things that matter. And for Jacob, it was a matter of life and death that he was wrestling with God over. It was a matter of legitimacy. He did not want to go back and meet Esau as a thief. He wanted a legitimate blessing. But for God, you know, it was about much more than just that. It was about the birth of an entire nation. It was about legacy. It was about building God's people. It was about building a nation that God would call his people. See, when we struggle and battle with God in prayer, sometimes we don't get to understand how big the picture really is. Jacob had no idea what he was blessing for, uh, what he was wrestling for was the birth of an entire nation. The issue he was wrestling for was bigger than he knew. God knows the bigger story. In those hard times, God knows you might think there's something on the line. God knows what else is on the line. You know, by crossing this river Jabbok, Jacob was about to enter Esau's territory. But God saw something more significant than that. By crossing the Jabbok, Jacob would be entering into the land that God had promised to give Abraham's descendants. The promised land. God was not about to let Jacob enter the promised land, this land of blessing and favor, on his own terms or in his own strength. God will not let you go into the promised land in your own strength. Why? Because he knows you'll mess it up. He knows you'll fail. If we are going to go ahead for the promises God has given us as a church or in our own lives, we need to understand we don't do it in our own strength. It's got to be in God's. No matter where we go as a church, we are not going without God. Now if that means it takes longer than we'd like it to take, so be it. If that means things have to change, even things we don't want to change, then so be it. If it means dealing with frustration and the bigger picture that we don't understand right now, then that's the way it'll be. But we will not, as a church, go into the promised land on our own strength. We won't do that. So as God appears in the form of a man and wrestles with Jacob doesn't do it for sport. He does it to teach Jacob some important truths and to make Jacob fight 
for his blessing. You know, often we pray for things and we say we believe God's asked for it or we say we believe God's going to do it. But do we fight for it? Really? Because if we're not willing to fight for it, then I doubt how much we really want it. See, God wanted to make Jacob fight for it. Because fighting for something shows passion. It shows commitment. It shows that you care about it. Is this something you've ever wanted from God? And when resistance came in your prayer time, what did you do? Did you fight? Or did you back down? See, God wants us to be fighters. Because fighters are passionate. In Hosea 12, uh, verse 4, it talks about this time that Jacob wrestled with God. And it says this, he strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He wept. He put his body and his spirit into this wrestling match, into this struggle. He earnestly pleaded with God for a blessing. He didn't just hold on and say, God, I want a blessing. No, he wept. He went through it. Jacob battled for this answer to prayer. And I know often we say we're battling for something. But I wonder, how much battling really goes on? Let me give you an example. Okay. Ian, do you want to come forward? Right. I'm going to wrestle with Ian. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay, first of all, this is how Jacob wrestled. I'll put this down. That's how Jacob wrestled. <laughs> this is how often our prayer life wrestles with God. That is how our prayer life often is. We hold on for a bit. Now forget it. Forget it. probably sweating. <laughs> right. Okay, <laughs> I've completely lost my point now. <laughs> you get the difference. We say we're wrestling. We're not. We're just holding on a little bit. And then we give in and think, nah, can't be. I'm so out of breath. We must understand, answers to prayer do not always come easily. A lot of the time, there is a struggle involved. There's tears. There's sweat. There's exhaustion. But the trouble is, is we start to wrestle a little bit and then we surrender and assume the answer is no. If Jacob had done that, he would not have received the blessing that God wanted him to have. Now I've done this, I've done this. And I reckon we've all done this. We, we, we wonder why there's no answer. We wonder why there's no breakthrough. And it's because we've got no fight in us. We've got no passion in us. We say we want it, but we don't fight for it. Have you ever prayed with a passion that made you mentally and physically tired? 
Have you ever been in a place so desperate where you needed that answer so badly that you felt like you can't get up off your knees until you've got some sense of peace? That is hanging on in prayer. That's digging in. That's wrestling with the issue until you get an answer. You see, Jacob didn't wrestle with God for five minutes. He didn't wrestle with God for a few hours. He wrestled with God all night. Right up until the sun's coming up. His name means heel grabber. And that's exactly what he did. He would not let go. And when all he could grab was a leg, he grabbed a leg. And he held on to it. Is your need great? Are you facing something difficult in your life? Are you tired of being the way you are? Are you sick of the hold sin has on you? Then you might have to fight for the victory. How badly do you want it? God made Jacob fight. See, wrestling is not something you do lightly, I can tell you. <laughs> Nothing takes more energy and continual effort than wrestling does. It's constant. It's tiring. And the second you back down in a wrestling match is the second you've lost it. That's how our prayer life should look. We keep our ground. We keep persisting. We never let go. And when it feels like the battle is over, still don't let go. Keep persisting. Keep holding tight. They wrestled all night. And then the match comes to an end. Not when Jacob gave in, but when God dislocated his hip with one touch. One touch. See, this puts the whole thing into perspective. This wrestling match was not a struggle with God. Jacob was never going to overcome God. No, no, God, for God, this wasn't a struggle. This wasn't a big effort for God. He allowed Jacob to battle him until the moment he chose to end it. God was always in control of this wrestling match. He was always in control of the situation. Whatever you're facing in your life, let me tell you, there is no point that God is not in control. He's in control. He is not worried about how the situation is going to end. It was God that allowed him to fight. It was as if God was saying, Jacob, give me your best shot. And then God showed complete superiority with one touch. One touch. This wrestling is not a case of Jacob pushing God around until he gets an answer. This is not Jacob pushing God around until he gets what he wants. No, this is God wanting to see his passion as he struggles. But Jacob was never going to win this fight. Never. 1 Corinthians 1.25, it says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God stronger than men. The results of this dislocation weakened Jacob. It made him vulnerable. At a time in his life that he did not want to be vulnerable. You're going to wrestle with God, expect to come away vulnerable. Even if you don't want to be. Jacob was about to face a man that wanted to kill him. That is not something you want to do with a limp. It is not something you want to do in a vulnerable state. You know, the thigh, when you're wrestling, it's the pillar of your strength. And the hip, that's where all the force comes from. So the second that hip is dislocated, Game over. Done. Jacob can't even stand on his own. But he still doesn't let go. 
Jacob suddenly is no longer relying on his own strength. And it's here that he says, I will not let go of you. He knows he can't continue to fight. He knows he can't win. He knows that any blessing he gets at this point, it's not his own doing. It's something that's given by God. When we're vulnerable, when our strength is gone, when we have nothing left, that's when God can work in us. Because we're no longer relying on ourselves. We're not relying on our strength. We're trusting in His. When we realize that we can't support ourselves, then we really understand how important His support is. And this is the turning point for Jacob. Let me tell you this morning, we've got to stop relying on ourselves. We are not the deciding factor of any battle that we're in. We're not. It's his strength. It's not ours. And it's not until we realize that do we really give God space to work in our lives. When we realize our strength is not the solution. More often than not, our strength is the problem. God broke Jacob to get him into a place where he'd realize this. Ian, can you open those windows? Is anyone else boiling? God broke him to get him to this place. And God blesses him. God gives Jacob what he asked for. And in the process, he changes Jacob and gives him a new name. He says, no longer will you be known as the supplanter, as the deceiver. Now you will be called Israel. Before the blessing, God insists that Jacob tells him his name. Why does he do this? Doesn't God already know his name? He knows who he's wrestling with. He knows this is Jacob. Of course he does. But you see, for Jacob, saying his name, Jacob, it's an act of confession. It's an admittance of his nature. I'm Jacob. I'm the supplanter. I'm the deceiver. Understand this, not repenting, not dealing with the sin in your life is robbing you of a blessing. It's putting you in a position where you can have encounter after encounter with God and nothing changes in you. Because plain and simple, there can be a lack of repentance. Some of us, there are things that happened years ago that we've never dealt with and we've never confessed to God. Just like Jacob. He never dealt with this. We've never really repented and we wonder, where's the blockage? What we've done is instead of repenting of the past, we've justified it. Some of us have talked it away and made it into nothing. We've made it out not to be a big deal. But deep down, deep down we know it's a big deal. Deep down we know we need to deal with it still. Or we'll never move forward with God. Let me tell you, God will never force you to repent. Repentance, it's on us. It's on us. Admitting to our sin, it's all on us. Dealing with it, well, he's already done that. Thank God. But until we admit it, until we repent, we're not putting it in God's hands. A true encounter with God brings with it a sense of repentance. Time and time again, Christians can seem like they're going with God. They're going strong for God. But they have the best intentions towards God. But if they're not dealing with their sin, they're robbing themselves of a chance for God to truly bless them. 
and they find themselves going round and round in circles. Same old mistakes, same old problems. We have to stop. We have to repent. When God asks you your name, it's time to be honest. I'm the supplanter. I'm the adulterer. I'm the thief. I'm the liar. I'm the pervert. I'm the angry, unreasonable person. I'm the lazy person. I'm the selfish one. Whatever it is. By the way, if I've missed yours, that's just because I couldn't think of it. <laughs> that's not a comprehensive list. So often, we're looking for a breakthrough in our lives, and we're missing the one breakthrough that starts it all. We're so good at explaining away our past or convincing ourselves we were not the person to blame or talking ourselves up. Stop it. Stop it. Confess and repent. It was an act of confession for Jacob to say his name. I've sinned, God. I've sinned against my brother. I shouldn't have done that. John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jacob confessed. He said his name. It was a name that reflected his nature and his sin. And what does God do? Changes his name. Changes his name. That change of name was God showing Jacob he changed his heart. Israel does not mean deceiver. It means one who struggles with God and men. And he overcame. But this overcoming only happened when he confessed his sin and let God change his heart. Jacob not, did not overcome God in this time of wrestling. He can't overcome God. Jacob overcame his sin and his past through his desire to change and repent. This wasn't just about a blessing. It was about redemption. It was about making right those things he'd done wrong. It was about taking what he'd stolen and replacing it with something legitimate. Whatever you've done in the past, even the recent past, it does not need to haunt you. It doesn't need to. The way your life has been in the past does not have to dictate the way it's going to be in the future. Your sin should not have that kind of power over you because God's already beaten it. When we come to God, when we repent, we give it to Him. And guess what? When we give it to Him, we don't have to keep hold of it anymore. We can let it go. When something is placed at the foot of the cross, you do not have to come back to it. Leave it there. What he's taken away from you, believe he's taken it. You know, one reason Christians struggle with the same old sin or the same old mistakes time and again is that they don't really give it to God. They keep a hold of it. And then they wonder why it keeps coming back. Just let go. Let go. It's not repentance if you keep picking it back up again. The cross is enough to deal with all of it. See, the cross is enough. You don't need to add anything else to the cross. Jesus died to set you free from your sin and from your mistakes. So believe when you give them to him that he's got it. 
You know, after all of this, Jacob is finally ready to go and meet Esau again. He's tired, he's broken, can't walk properly, and he's no longer relying on himself anymore. Genesis 33, he meets up with Esau, says this, and Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming with 400 men with him. And he divided the children amongst Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. Then he went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. And when Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, who are these with you? Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and they bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And last, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. And Esau said, what do you mean by all of this company that I've met? And Jacob answered, to find favor in your sight. But Esau said, I have enough, brother. Keep what you have for yourself. All the fear, all the doubts, all the deception. He runs hugs him, kisses him, and cries. I wonder if this conversation would have gone differently without that encounter with God. I don't know. But what I know is when Jacob met his brother this time, it wasn't with a stalling blessing. It was with a legitimate blessing. What Jacob now had, he'd been given. He was walking in a different blessing and the man who wanted him dead kissed him and wept. Wrestling with God means we hang on. We don't give up. We don't let go. If what you're pushing through for in prayer is important, don't let go. Don't let go. Push through. Push through the times where it seems impossible. Push through the times where it just feels like it's not going to happen. Push through the pain. Push through the doubt. When you're tired, don't stop. When it feels like you're getting nowhere, don't stop. When it feels like the answer's gonna escape you, don't let go. It's God who chose this moment of encounter. And it's God that chooses the moments that he encounters you, not us. Just because we want to do God to do something in a certain time or a certain place, it doesn't mean he will. But God chose this moment at Jabbok, and you know what? He chose the right moment. He always does. It wasn't in Jacob's diary, but it was in God's diary. But Jacob still had the opportunity not to meet him. He didn't have to wrestle. God can place opportunities in front of you. You don't have to take them. You don't have to have that encounter with him. But it's us that miss out. You know, Jacob wasn't just asking for a blessing for himself. This was about legacy. This was about a nation. This was about other people. 
I wonder when we seek a blessing from God. Is it for ourselves? Or is it, for big, is it bigger than that? Is it for others? God, bless me so that I can be a blessing. Bless me, touch me, forgive me, not just for my sake, but for the sake of the world around me. For the sake of the lost. For the sake of this world. Set a fire in me, God, so that other people may come to know you. Change me so that Billy and them may be changed. Why do we want to be blessed? Because the greatest blessings are those that allow us to be used by God to bless other people. You know, we cannot, cannot get stuck into that bless me Christianity. Oh God, just bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, 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 me. We are blessed to be a blessing. Heaven forbid our focus becomes the blessing we can get for ourselves. While Billingham, Teesside, and our nation descends further and further into darkness. And Billingham needs us. Doesn't know that. Well, not us. God. We must remember God is the one who's in control. We pray. We wrestle. We aren't going to defeat him. We don't make demands of God. But God responds to our passion. I believe that. He sees our passion and our determination and he reacts. Prayer isn't about changing God's mind. There are only, um, the, there's instances in the Bible where God's mind is changed by somebody. But they are very few. Very few. Prayer is partnering with God. Prayer is putting ourselves in the gap. It's showing God that what's important to him is important to us. And that we're willing to fight for it. It's showing God that we're submitting ourselves to be used by him. It's humbling ourselves to be totally dependent on him and not ourselves. That's what prayer is. And be prepared. Because an encounter with God changes you. It left Jacob as a vulnerable man with a new name and a new future. But it cost him his strength. It cost him that strength for the rest of his life. It's on God's terms, not ours. An encounter with God is intertwined with repentance. When we're in his presence, the knowledge of our sin begins to grow. We see where we lack. And if we don't repent, we won't move on. An encounter that doesn't bring repentance is not really an encounter. It's an experience. But when we repent, everything can change. Even our names. It's not about the blessing. It's about stepping into the plans God has for us. It's about his will. I wonder this morning, how desperate are you to meet with God? How is your prayer life? Are you a half-hearted wrestler? Or do you cling on and if all you can grab is a leg, grab a leg and hold on? It takes a lot more faith to hold on tight. But it brings a lot more results. Are we a church that believes God can change situations? Are we a church that believes in the miraculous? Are we a church that believes in the supernatural power of God? Then we need to be a church that fights for it. We need to be a church that stands in the gap for people. We need to be a church that can pray for somebody who hasn't been healed 
time and time again and say, God, I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. We need to be a church that allows God to have his way, not our way. That relies on his strength, not our strength. That's a church that fights. That's a church that knows how to wrestle. Can we stand? I just want to pray. And musicians, if you want to make your way back.